Adventure on the American frontier with the Weston family and Daniel Boone in the exciting days following the American Revolution. We interrupt this program for a special news bulletin. Great Britain went to war against Germany today. 25 years and 30 days from the time she entered the war of 1914 against the same enemy. France is expected to follow suit within the next few hours. The state of war came into existence. The President of the United States. I hope the United States will keep out of this war. I believe that it will. And I give you assurance and reassurance that every effort of your government will be directed toward that end. A Gallup poll taken in 1937 had revealed that two out of three Americans believed our involvement in World War I had been a mistake. How is it then that the United States, still deeply isolationist, possessed of elaborate neutrality laws, determined to keep the peace and remain neutral, takes part in a second world war? How does that war affect the American people? What is the quality of life for those who remain at home? German invasion of Poland, President Roosevelt announces, This nation will remain a neutral nation. But I cannot ask that every American remain neutral in thought as well. Even a neutral cannot be asked to close his mind or close his conscience. By 1940, Germany is formally allied with Italy and Japan. The brutality, the bigotry, the insatiable expansion of totalitarianism in these countries are leading America closer and closer to war. With the fall of France in June 1940, 69% of the American public believes another German victory will menace their security. However, not all Americans are concerned. The America First Committee insists that we must not interfere in Europe. Charles Lindbergh, their famous spokesman, asserts that England is for all intents and purposes defeated. He calls for a negotiated settlement. If we enter fighting for democracy abroad, we may end by losing it at home. But an influential citizens group called the Committee to Defend America by Aiding the Allies believes that American involvement is essential. Soon the government does begin to supply the Allies. But Nazi submarines take a terrible toll of war aid for Britain. By the spring of 1941, America is fighting an undeclared naval war against Germany. In August, off the coast of Newfoundland, Roosevelt meets with Winston Churchill to draw up the Atlantic Charter. Declaring their unanimity on post-war aims, they vow to build a permanent peace structure, a United Nations, and promise a world free from fear, want, and oppression. But now events in the Pacific are coming to a head. For years, we had been supplying Japan with petroleum products and scrap metal. But after the fall of France, when Japan occupies French Indochina, American foreign policy hardens. The United States declares an embargo which brings Japanese-American trade to a halt. America's price for lifting the embargo is Japan's exit from Indochina and China and her promise not to change through force the status quo in the Pacific.
early in December 1941. Negotiations on these points are still going on in Washington. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. The attack also was made on all naval and military activities on the principal island of Oahu. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. On December 8th, the United States acknowledges that a state of war exists between herself and Japan. Three days later, we are also at war with Germany and Italy. In December of 1941, the United States military is unprepared for war. The one and a half million man army still uses World War I equipment. The armored corps is no match for the German panzer. Air Corps equipment is outdated, and the Navy is a weak third best in the world. But Americans are determined to carry the battle to the end. They are at last united. The nation mobilizes with a single purpose, to win the war. Some 15 million Americans, most of them drafted, will see service in the armed forces. For the first time, there are women enlistees in all the services. And these women perform more than the traditional nursing functions. New Year's Eve, 1941. Much of American industry is on a round-the-clock schedule. Shipyards expand with dizzying speed. Bethlehem Steel grows 30-fold. Henry Kaiser builds 58 new yards in just a few months. Through new developments in engineering and prefabrication, Kaiser is able to assemble freighters called Liberty Ships in just 10 days. In February 1942, the last automobile is produced for the civilian market as an entire industry retools for war. It will produce thousands of jeeps, tanks, planes, and small boats. In other industries, the same retooling takes place. A machine maker fabricates guns. A bedspread manufacturer makes camouflage netting. A mechanical pencil factory turns out bomb parts. And a soft drink bottler pours gunpowder into artillery shells. Science is mobilized, and the nation's researchers soon develop radar, the proximity fuse, a new bomb site, the first self-sustaining atomic reaction. By 1944, 17 and a half million persons will be in war production. The U.S. economy will supply not only our own armed forces, but help supply the British, the Russians, the Chinese, and the free French as well. The government spends between 1941 and 1945 10 times as much as was spent in the previous 160 years of its existence. The $321 billion spent for war production finally ends the Great Depression. To implement this massive production, control of the whole industry, life, and purpose of the nation becomes concentrated in Washington. Agencies like the War Production Board, the Office of Defense Transportation, the Office of Price Administration, and the War Labor Board direct or oversee the entire war effort. Raw materials like petroleum are tightly controlled by a priority system and industries are assigned precise allowances. Contractors are directed what to make and how to make it. New facilities are constructed with government funds. To finance the effort, income taxes are increased and withholding tax introduced. Corporations are taxed on their excess profits. The government borrows money from banks, corporations, and private individuals in the form of war bonds and savings stamps. 
throughout the war, the home front rallying cry is buy bonds. As employment booms and manpower demands grow and grow, great population movements occur. Seven million people leave rural areas for shipyards and war plants. Southern poor whites go to southeastern shipyards. Blacks go to northern and west coast shipyards and factories. Easterners move west and Midwesterners move east. And when the work runs out in one place or a worker becomes bored, he moves again. In California, the boom looks like the gold rush of 1849 all over again. Around every war plant, foundry, and shipyard, defense cities spring up to house the thousands of new workers. But many land in trailer complexes just outside the cities and outside city services. A billion dollar government building program doesn't begin to satisfy the needs. A terrible housing situation develops. With work going on round the clock, a dwelling will often be occupied by one family during the day shift and another at night. Some urban situations become very tense. Southern sharecroppers come north for higher salaries, find themselves in close proximity with blacks who refuse to accept abusive treatment. While the racist doctrines of Hitler are being fought overseas, many whites react against the rapid gains of blacks at home. But riots notwithstanding, millions of black Americans have made important gains. In 1941, A. Philip Randolph, president of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, had called upon 50,000 blacks to march on Washington to demand that the president prevent their exclusion from defense jobs. Roosevelt finally made the concession and issued an executive order forbidding discrimination in work on defense contracts and setting up the Fair Employment Practices Committee. By the end of the war, there are more than two million black workers in war plants across the country. Loss of civil liberties during the war is for the most part avoided. The great exception, however, involves Americans of Japanese descent. 100,000 Japanese Americans living on the West Coast are removed from their homes and sent to so-called resettlement centers. Homes are given up, businesses sold, communities abandoned. Though many are American citizens born in this country, they are removed without indictment and without trial. Their experience of racial slurs and other indignities remains a dark blot on U.S. history. The United States government is now spending $150 million a day. In factories and on farms, women have been helping to alleviate the persistent manpower shortage. Soon, Rosie the Riveter becomes a part of the language. And as manufacturers discover that women can perform some tasks better than men, the demand for female workers becomes greater than the supply. But with mothers working and fathers at war, children are left to fend for themselves and some get into trouble. With child labor laws relaxed for the duration, one third of the nation's teenagers enter the factories. Though farm populations have dropped 17%, the remaining commercial farms manage to increase the total output. Enjoying plentiful rains, the former dust bowl blossoms productively. But though food production increases 50%, enormous amounts are sent overseas, and the demand at home is ever greater. Income is up 65% over depression levels, much of it in the pockets of people who have not eaten adequately for years. In March 1943, the Office of Price Administration institutes a system of rationing. When forewarning leaks out, grocery shelves are immediately picked clean of rationable items. This 
despite paychecks inflated by long hours of overtime, workers find that many items are now unavailable or for sale in restricted quantities. Coffee, sugar, and butter become very scarce. Gasoline is limited to three gallons a week and will later be reduced to two. Because there is no rubber for tires, a national speed limit is established at 35 miles per hour. Soon, there are no new appliances. With cotton needed for uniforms, baby diapers become scarce. And with steel tightly controlled, there are no safety pins to fasten the non-existent diapers. Children's metal toys are replaced by wooden imitations. All toothpaste tubes are turned in with the purchase of new ones. Victory suits appear for men, without vests and without cuffs, to save cloth. Because nylon is needed for parachutes, women resort to paint-on stockings. All advertising is tied to the war effort as various manufacturers proclaim their patriotism. The ad industry does its share, however, designing massive campaigns for home front conservation or war bond sales, blood donations, and security observance. Despite an effort to hold down inflation, cost of some items more than double. Upward prices give ammunition to labor's fight against fixed wages. Labor has pledged no strikes for the duration, but this proves impossible to accomplish. Throughout the war, industry is plagued by work stoppages. In all, 36 million man days are lost. Public feeling against unions, justified or not, runs high. With the new, mostly unskilled labor forces, the accident situation is even worse. 37,000 persons die in industrial accidents in 1942 and 43. This is 7,000 more than the war deaths for that period. In all, there are seven million accidents during the war, disabling four and one-half million men and women. In January 1943, President Roosevelt meets with Churchill at Casablanca. They announce that the war will be fought until unconditional surrender, and with Charles de Gaulle, discuss the part to be played by the Free French and the possible opening of a second front. And in May 1943, victory at El Alamein. In November, Roosevelt and Stalin meet at Cairo and agree to time the invasion of France with a Russian assault from the east. As the war progresses, the rationing system becomes more and more elaborate. Different point values are assigned to items like cigarettes, candy, and meat to define the worth of various cuts of beef. A 40,000-word booklet is published. Chicken soon replaces beef on many American tables, and even horse meat makes a brief appearance. A Nebraska senator says with admirable directness, the whole thing is nutty. But despite rationing and price fixing, the control of food is impossible. The black market becomes a part of everyday life. To help alleviate the food situation, 20 million victory gardens are planted. Soon, every backyard and vacant lot in the country seems to have vegetables growing in it. Many cities have communal gardens in their parks. Mothers revive the nearly lost art of home canning. Competitions are established to see who can grow the finest vegetables, and New York City has its own version of the country fair. It is finally estimated that Victory Gardens produce 40% of all vegetables grown in the United States. Home front war energies are channeled in several other directions. American families collect thousands of pounds of tin, mountains of rubber, numberless bundles of paper, and a wide assortment of scrap metal. Housewives save tons of fat, for one pound contains enough glycerin to make a pound of black powder. Children buy a billion dollars worth of stamps and bonds and sell eight billion dollars more. Then, in 
June 6, 1944, D-Day. Combined American, British, and Free French forces open the long-awaited second front. Russia, meanwhile, has begun her own massive offensive. Already the decision has been made to let the Russians liberate Berlin. In February 1945, with the war in Europe at last drawing to a close, Roosevelt and Churchill meet with Stalin at the Russian town of Yalta. They seek a firm pledge from Stalin that he will now enter the war against Japan. The Allies also agree on territorial boundaries to be set up in Europe and Asia. Russia will violate some of them even before the war is over. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin from CBS World News. President Roosevelt is dead. The president died of a cer cerebral hemorrhage. All we know so far is that the president died at Warm Springs in Georgia. April 12, 1945, Harry S. Truman becomes president of the United States. And on May 8, 1945, General Eisenhower informs me that the forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. The flags of freedom fly all over Europe. Americans celebrate the news quietly, but the defeat of Japan is still to come, and experts have predicted a cost of 175,000 American lives. Only a handful of people know that the U.S. is developing an atomic bomb. will note that the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, a military base. We have used it in order to shorten the agony of war, in order to save the lives of thousands and thousands of young Americans. August 13, 1945. 7 p.m. Eastern Wartime, Bob Trout reporting. The Japanese have accepted our terms fully. That's the word we've just received from the White House in Washington. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the Second World War. The United Nations on land, on the sea, in the air, and to the four corners of the earth are united and are victorious. We got that information on a special line from the White House, and now it's beginning to come in on the wire services, too. President Truman announced it at 7 p.m. tonight, just a minute ago, and now a flash. MacArthur appointed Jap boss over the Emperor of Japan. The celebration lasts two days. The most destructive war in human history has ended. Fought all around the globe, it has cost 15 million military lives and at least that many civilians. Almost one half million Americans are dead and nearly three quarters of a million are wounded. Another 66,000 are missing in action. For four years, the American people have labored and the results of their energies have changed the very nature of warfare. Never before had an army been so well equipped, so well supplied. Never had the home front so participated in the outcome of a war. For four years, Americans have longed for the boys' return, for an end to shortages, an end to war's dislocations. During those years, the United States has moved from isolationism to world leadership. But the war's end, with the unconditional surrender of the Axis powers, gives rise to both new promise and to new problems. With the establishment of the United Nations, the world has hoped for a permanent peace. But wartime harmony is soon replaced by tensions among the Allies. In the post-war period, the United States will have two major responsibilities. To use its leadership to help maintain the precarious world peace and to provide a meaningful quality of life for its citizens.